oftentimes data files may have multiple values on a single line. You can think of these as a record with multiple fields. So here my little text file has six names and scores for each of those six uh, students on a test. So Ryan scored an 87, Jill scored a 94, and so forth. These are comma separated. It's saved as a text file. I want to read this into an array, but I'm, I'm going to use something called parallel arrays. I'm going to have an array for the names and an array for the scores. So I'm giving students as a string array containing six values and score as an integer array containing six values. And then I've got another array here that's going to have two values, zero and one elements. It's going to contain a string, and we'll see how we use that in a minute. I've got a string variable called prompt, which contains nothing, and that's going to be used in creating this message box prompt. We're going to open up our stream reader and read in the data from our text file called parallelgrades.txt. So I'm going to use a loop to do that. Now I'm going to read one line at a time. So my first line is going to be Ryan, 87. And that's what sr.readline is going to bring in. But then I've added in a string method called split. And inside the parentheses for the split method, I've specified a comma inside quotes. And this is what that's going to do. It's going to look at that line. It's going to look for the comma. And it's going to take the information before the comma and read that into my first element of an array called my array. And then the second item after the comma is going to put into the second element, so my array sub 1. Then I'm going to take those two values from that array and put those into my two parallel arrays. So element 0 of my array goes into my student sub i, and element 1 of my array goes into score sub i. And the result is, when I, once I've read all of that data in, I now have two arrays, one with all the student names as a string array, and one with all the scores as an integer array. And it corresponds so that Alan, element sub 3 of student array, got a score of 84, which is element sub 3 of my score array. Then I'm going to display that information in a message box by building a prompt through a loop that is simply looking at each of the values for student and score and adding a carriage return. And I'm seeing my six lines of data here specified in this message box. Well, I want to sort this data. And this is where we end up with a problem. If I used array.sort student and array.sort score, which we saw in the previous video, it's going to sort my student array and it's going to sort my score array, but they're not tied together. And the result is I have now swapped elements in such a way that they're no longer tied. So Ryan now, who had an, an 87 before, ends up with a 94. He's pretty happy. But look at poor Alan. Alan, who had a score of 84, now has a score of 59 once these are sorted. Here's the same code in C Sharp. Again, using array.sort and building my, my prompt strings. We have the same problem here as we sort these two parallel arrays in that the values are no longer tied together. So how do we get around that? Well, we have to write a sort routine. The arrays.sort uh, does not take into account parallel arrays. So we have to write our own routine, our own method to do that. And here I've got a method that I've created called sort the arrays. We're going to assume that our two arrays, student and score here, were declared globally. So we can reference them here in this uh, separate subroutine. This is called a bubble sort algorithm. There are lots of different sort algorithms, and bubble sorts are very simple. They work great for small amounts of data. If we were approaching several thousand records here, it would take a, a fair amount of time to do the sort with a bubble sort. But for small amounts of data, it works great. And it's really simple to understand how a sort routine can work. What I have are two loops, one nested inside the other. The first loop is going to go from the very first element, sub 0, to the second to last element. In this case, it's going to be 4. And the loop inside, which is value j, is going to go from whatever the next element is of the current value of i to the last element. 
And all we're going to do here is compare the elements in, in the student name. And if the lower one is of a lesser value alphabetically than my i value, and you see here i is 0, and j is going to start out as 1, um, Jill's going to be less than Ryan. It's going to swap those two values, and it's also going to swap the values and score, so it keeps these tied together. So let's walk through how this works. So if student sub j Jill is less than student sub i Ryan, which is a true statement, it's going to execute the body of our if structure. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take two variables, temp student and temp score, and we're going to store the values in elements sub zero, both of the student and the score. Then we're going to place the value of element i into the value of element zero for both student and score. And then we're going to take the value that's in the temp student and temp score and place that in element sub 1. And the result is we have swapped these two elements. J then takes on a value of 2 and now we're comparing element sub 0 which is Jill with Luke and asking is Luke less than Jill? It is not. It's a false statement. So none of the code in our if structure is going to execute. Then we increment j to 3, and now we're comparing Jill and Alan. Well, Alan is less than Jill. That's a true statement, so we're going to swap these values. We're going to place whatever's in element sub i, which is 0. Uh, Jill in 94 is going to go in this temp student and temp score. Then we're going to take the value that's in element sub 3, Alan, in 84, and place that in element sub 0. And then we're going to take our temp values and put those in element sub 3. And we have now swapped element 0 and element 3. Next, we're going to increment j again to 4. And we're going to compare Paul and, and Alan. That's a false comparison, false Boolean value. We're going to go on to compare Alan and Beth as j becomes 5. And that's a false value. And so the if structure is not executed in either of those. We've reached the upper limit of our j value, and so now we're going to increment i to 1, and j is going to start out at i plus 1, which is 2, and we're going to compare element 1 and element 2. And once again, Luke is less than Ryan, so we're going to swap the values that's in elements of 1, which is Ryan and 87, into our temp scores. Then we're going to take the value that's in elements of 2 and copy it into elements of 1. And then we'll take the values in the temp and place that in element sub 2. So we swapped those two values both for student and score and kept those, those two fields tied together. We're going to increment j to 3 and compare Jill to Luke, and that's a true statement. And so we're going to end up swapping those two values. And then we're going to compare Jill to Paul. That is a false statement, so nothing happens. And we're going to compare Jill to Beth, element sub 1 to element sub 5. That is a true statement, and we're going to swap those two values. We've now reached the upper limit of J, and so I is going to increment to 2. Now we've done two passes for value I, I equals 0 and I equals 1. After those two passes, we now have the two lowest values alphabetically in student array and their scores correspondingly in the first two values of our score array. So now we're comparing element 2 and element 3. And we're going to swap Luke and Ryan because Luke is less than Ryan and, and swap the score values. And then we'll compare Luke and Paul. Nothing happens there. And then we'll, we'll compare Luke and Jill and that is a true uh, comparison. Student sub J, Jill is less than student sub i, Luke, and we're going to swap those two values. So after three passes, we now have the lowest three values of, of our student array in the top three elements. We're going to continue comparing, and i is now 3, and j becomes i plus 1, or 4, and we're going to compare Paul and Ryan, and that is a true statement, so we're going to swap those. And then we're going to compare Paul and Luke, and that is a true statement, and we're going to swap those. I then becomes 4, and J is only going to go from 5 to 5.
and all we're doing is comparing Paul and Ryan, and we're swapping those two values. The result is our student array is now sorted, and the data in score is, is still linked to those various elements so that student sub 2, which is Jill, retains a score of 94.